It's supposed to be when it is done by young people like this. It's supposed to be like a disruption, you know, in, in the in the way things are now. It's it's, it's supposed to be like a takeover generation, you know, um, outside of the conspiracy theories of new world order. That's that's different. I'm sure she, he's using it on a different of a different level. He's using it as disruption, you know, from present way that things are. Um, you can call it a youth takeover. So I'm curious to see how, you know, how they are defining their own new world order. Generally, I think that, you know, uh, young people are the future, and they should they should seize the moment. They should leave, uh, should not leave anything to chance. <laughs> you know, if you need something, if you want something, you, you go for it. And and they have the energy, they have the education already, and. They should make this country the, the exact way that they want. The people deserve, you know, the leadership that they get. So their generation is probably the rescue generation. So we are hoping that that will happen sooner than later. NFA is bringing creatives together to help other aspiring creatives learn and impact them with knowledge. So that's I'm really big on that. Like any way I can give what it, what it I have in terms of knowledge to other people for them to learn, I'm always down. So I think it's great that he's organized this. Um, to young people that are in the creative industry, um, it's very, it's, it's not it's not for the faint hearted. It's very difficult in, in the sense that you have to be determined and you have to be persistent, but it's doable. It's amazing. Once you get into it, once you know why you're in the entertainment industry and what you're, and, establish what your passion is and your brand identity, you could definitely change, you could impact. We are here at 12th Temple in Ikoyi to have conversations, to meet new people, to socialize and to network with some of the best creatives that Lagos has to offer. I've been running my brand for about eight years, um, before which I was interning for about three to four years. Um, and I'm very glad to be here. Some of the challenges I faced in the fashion industry here it's basically in terms of foundational issues. I think that the structure set before us wasn't really there for us to actually promote or in fact create successful fashion businesses when I started. In terms of funding, in terms of factories, in terms of places that we need, resources, we didn't have a lot of that. So a lot of those things were stifling at first, but because I feel like it's important for us to address these problems and use them to even sort of fuel our passions, it didn't really stop me. So those are some of the things I faced, but now I'm glad to say that some of those things are being solved thanks to platforms like Lagos Fashion Week and Style House as well. So, yeah. hey, I am here at the New World Order brunch and I think it's an exciting opportunity to meet like-minded individuals and just to have fun in a chilled environment and I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> I'm here at the New World Order brunch. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting more creatives like myself and uh, you know just network and learn new stuff it's a new year and we want to do things bigger and better, so I'm excited. We have influencers, we have models, we have designers, 
We have oh. actors, um, veteran actor RMD is in the building, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at this point, I would like to invite my two panelists. Uh, the first one is someone who needs no introduction. He is the founder and creative director of Orange Culture, an androgynous menswear brand right here in Nigeria. His name is Bio Okegawa. Please give him a Um, and our second panelist also needs no introduction. She is an icon in the media industry. She's a presenter. She's a TV personality. She's an actress. Please help me to welcome Stephanie Coger. Acting is a muscle that you must always, you know, exercise. Hosting to me is it's innate. I just host because I'm, I like talking to people, I'm quite bubbly and things like that. So I have the traits of a TV host. But acting is like, yeah, it's not child's play. So that's something that I'm very passionate about, but I take very seriously. And I don't just want to just act because I've given a script and a platform. So yeah, I'm, I'm predominantly a TV host. <laughs> so you feel like acting is something that you have to see? Study more. It's of more course. Like craft, whereas presenting comes more naturally. I mean, don't get me wrong, you still do need to study presenting. I mean, there are skills and techniques for presenting. But what I'm saying is that I know that I this is the only thing that I can do. I'm a presenter, like I'm a natural born presenter. Okay. But with acting, it's you're going into different people's lives, you're going into different characters. So it's a definitely every time an actor picks up a new script, you still have it's like learn all over again. You're becoming somebody else. So that's why I say it's such a craft that shouldn't be toyed with. The people just think, oh, I can act. No. Even presenting, no. No, everybody's supposed to just present. You have to know. But acting, for me, I love it so much and I respect the craft. So, yeah, I just think it's just something I understand. So I'm a TV host. I think that was your question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm a TV host. Okay, and Bio, so you are the founder of Orange Culture. Now, Orange Culture, I'm sure everyone here is familiar in some way with Bio's work. An absolutely incredible fashion line. They make some of the most amazing clothes I've ever seen. I think Bio is the perfect example of uh, fashion as a form of art as opposed to just clothing. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind Orange Culture and um, how you got started with fashion? Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So, my name is Adebayo Akimawa, and I'm the creative director of Orange Culture. Um, my brand is about eight years now. I started it in 2010, slash 2011. Um, I basically started the brand, the brand when I was 20 years old. I had saved all that I had um, growing up, because I started in 20 when I was 16, so I would work with like, fashion houses, with magazines, with brands, just to save up money to eventually start my own brand. And because I didn't go to fashion school, I really knew that I needed to understand the industry, work with people who had more knowledge and sort of prepare myself for the industry at hand. So I eventually launched the brand in 2010 and it's a brand that is focused on pushing boundaries. So we weren't just about creating clothing that already existed, it was about creating something that was new, about creating something that sort of started a conversation and also was something that could have been internationalized. We didn't just want to have a brand that you know would be everywhere in Lagos. One of the brands that would be in Lagos and would sell in New York, in Paris, in London, which really required a lot more work. So I launched the brand, and the brand's ethos is really just about challenging the ideas of societal norms. So it's not about being comfortable with what already exists, but about challenging what exists and why it exists. So a lot of the conversations we have go around, you know, sort of conversations that we have daily, conversations that we have in terms of emotional, um, emotional interactions between men, emotional interactions, to people you know, within the country, it's really about just getting people to talk about what you know our problems are and how we can use fashion to change. So it's about fashion that how fashion can be used for social change and not just about wearing clothes. So that's really what the brand does. Okay. So I'm really interested in the interaction between different uh, different aspects of the creative industry. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we have people here who are in fashion, we have people in music, we have people in art, people from all departments. Now, while I actually met you, I don't know if you remember this, 
at the watch of a video of Orange Culture in Selfridges in London. Mm -hmm. I think that was in 2017. Yes. Um, I was really interested in that particular collection because you weren't collaborating with another person in fashion. Mm -hmm. You weren't collaborating with a big you know, the model or someone in the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. You were collaborating with an opposition. Mm -hmm. I really want to know how did that particular collaboration the reason why that collaboration was necessary was because of the progression in the industry. I think, um, especially within Nigeria at the time, um, a lot of industries stood on their own. And if you look at international music and fashion, are always intertwined. It's not about just okay, you know, being a fashion designer, you being a musician, everybody just working on their own. It's about all of us working together as a whole, as a creative industry. So for us as Nigerians, we hadn't really had a lot of collaborations between designers and musicians. You know, you, musicians would wear the clothes, you know, but it wasn't anything more than that. So we wanted to create sort of something that, you know, would be more progressive in a sense, something that would actually tie us together and actually make us work together. So at that time, Selfridges was doing um, an event called Music Matters, and they had Justin Bieber do with another brand, had Issa Rocky do with another brand, and they had never had anyone from Africa before. So they sent me an email, and I remember I got the email, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, is this real? So I wasn't really sure because I was like, I selfish, why selfish is sending me an email? Um, so I spoke to Amoy Miyakirene, who is from Nevis Fashion Week, and she was like, yeah, they've been trying to reach you, you know, this is what, you know, they want to do, blah, 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 and they were like, they just want you to work with a musician, so think about who you can work with at the time, who will be open to working with you, and who also is on the international scale that they're looking for. So we had spoken to other artists at first, but it wasn't as you know, um, the relationship didn't seem to work at the time and we spoke to Davido and Davido was so open to it um, and basically what we wanted to do was to not just work with what we already do but to open us up to a whole demographic. So we wanted to work with David because David um, is, David basically represents a whole, gener a whole market that we hadn't really tapped, to, tapped into which was something that was more streetwear, more simplistic in a sense, something that was more everyday wear. We are more high fashion and we wanted to talk, um, tap into something that would open us up to a new demographic of young people. So we decided to do a collection with him about his song called If, and we basically just designed streetwear around, or merchandise rather, it wasn't about a collection, but about merchandise that you would see in a concert if he was performing and you would just pick them up from you know, some, somebody that was selling at the concert, things that you know, you'd want to wear if you really like the song. So we designed t-shirts, sweatshirts and whatnot, and they're sold out, they're not selfish anymore, so, <laughs> so that's a good sign. But basically that was how the collaboration came about, and it was such a fun collaboration for us because um, it really did open us up to new people. There are lots of people that maybe before they would have not really been interested in the brand, but because of David, they also tapped into the brand. And another thing it did for us was it showed the need for us to work together because as a creative industry, you know, we're all sort of moving or we're not moving as quick because everyone is doing it on their own. But I find that when you work together, the steps are a lot quicker. So we were able to push beyond, you know, a lot further, you know, because we're music and fashion. And we're able to reach lighting like dazed and go because we were using both of our interactions to engage them and show that okay, Nigeria has more to offer than just, you know, what already exists. Mm. Mm. Into some of the mm. Mm. And we had some of the kind of scribbles over there. Mm. That was a very interesting connection. Mm. Thank you for calling me I could be here. <laughs> but I'm I'm just happy that I, I'm really saying that my highlight is really my T V presenting course because for me Growing up, I always knew I wanted to be a TV presenter and obviously in the UK there's ways of going about it. So you can search the internet for um, jobs, you can audition, you can try and find an agent and then you know after a while we're struggling, you, know, you can get there. But in Nigeria it's not like that, we don't have structure. So I would say my highlight really has been setting up this presenting course and having people who are passionate, when you meet somebody who is also passionate about something you do, it's different mm -hmm. than just meeting somebody that, you know, from another industry. So meeting young presenters and being able to tell them that you could also do it and seeing some of them actually go out and work is definitely my highlight because there's no amount of money or red carpet show that I host that can make me feel the way I feel when somebody tells me, oh, I learned this from your class and oh, do you know what, I'm going to start this YouTube channel and I'm, I, I hope I become like you and I'm like, no, you can do better than me, like, you know, you can, you, but you can do it. But I'm just really passionate about that and I'm just happy that there's now, there's people working together to create structure. So there are agencies now, there are places where young people could go to train. 
Um, we need to do better, yes, but it's 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 happening, and that's definitely one of my highlights. Um, and another one, really, just being able to 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 host red carpets like the EMAs, um, being signed to international agencies um, in the US. Yeah, it, it's like validation, like oh, you're actually good at this. But honestly, it's really about seeing other people win in in media, especially young black women. So that's, that's really my highlight. I've seen a lot of students go on TV and yeah. Have you ever received some backlash from that? Has there ever been a moment where someone said, I hate what you're doing, mm -hmm. what you're doing is terrible for fashion? Anything along those lines? At the time, there was nobody doing what I was doing um, eight years ago. Now everyone has it. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so at that time, it was such a different place that we're in now. You know, your generation is, well, I, I don't know if I'm that far from generation, but your, um, some of your age range is a bit more expressive and more progressive. Um, the time when I was doing fashion was not that progressive at all. Um, and I remember the first year when we posted the first collection, we got so much. I remember like we, the first collection I did had a red suit and I remember that I got backlash for creating a, a red suit for a man. And now I'm sure everybody has like some colored suits in their closet, but then it was like, oh, you're doing this crazy thing. You need to stop creating red. Stop putting men in these colors. We're gonna go to hell. We're gonna... I was like, but it's just the colors, yeah. that, you know. So um, for the first three, four years, it was such a controversial um, time for the brand to exist, and we got so much blue back, um, which was so interesting because. Locally, we're getting so much negativity, but internationally, I remember like three years into my brand, I got my first Vogue feature. I mean, I got my first Vogue feature when I was in another country. I wasn't even in Nigeria. I went to Ghana for an exhibition, and Vogue, was, and the, one of the ladies from Vogue was there, and she just started raving. And from there, the next year, I was at the Louis Vuitton office. I was um, competing alongside brands like Goodbye Air and all of these other people. And for me, it was just a decision that I made that, you know what, I'm going to get this blue back, but I've realized that, especially in Nigeria, when you're doing something that's different, and not just Nigeria, I think in a lot of industries, when you're trying something that people haven't seen before, change is very hard for you to, you know, to take on. So it's never going to be easy, it's not going to be, oh, a joy ride. Sometimes people are going to hate it, they're going to give you negative feedback. The question is, are you passionate about it and do you love it? And if you're passionate about what you're talking about, question what you're doing, then it shouldn't really matter. Just keep pushing and focus. If you have focus and you have a clear vision, one thing that was for sure was even at 20, I knew what my vision was. I knew where I was going. I knew what I wanted to do. And so when everybody was talking, it was like, I wasn't hearing anything. I was just like, the only people I'm listening to are the credible people, the editors, the people who I feel actually can give me positive and constructive feedback. All the feedback that was just, I hate it, all this, that is not constructive in any way. I need feedback that will tell me, okay, we can work on your finishing, we can work on this, you can work on meeting these people, work on that. So those are the kind of things I took in and I focused on, and every other thing I just kind of shut out. Uh, foundation that's targeted at young women because obviously there's a there's a certain perception that we put out as celebrities, influencers, and um, just generally media personalities. Um, it's we get paid to do a job, right? It's show business, but then there becomes this thin line between show business and reality. And I don't think I think sometimes not enough of reality is being shown, especially in the entertainment industry in Nigeria. So I, I feel like that is my responsibility personally. I don't know about everybody else in entertainment, but I try to keep a balance now with that because I know I have young girls, especially with the program that I run, I have young girls that are looking up to me that don't really understand my story and they don't, they don't know it. So they don't know that, oh, I struggled, I moved to Nigeria, I, I was living like a cool life in London, like, you know, you can't really suffer in London like that. Mm -hmm. they, there's always job seekers allowance, last, last, you know, it's not, it's not that serious. But in Nigeria, it's like, no, you have to adapt, you have to, things are gonna, you're just going to be confused. You're just landing, you're like, what's going on? Especially if you're not from a completely privileged background. So they don't know that, oh, these things happened to me, like I had to oh, live in a BQ with, of rats in the floorboard, like I don't know what to do. My mom's calling me, come back home. What are you doing in Nigeria? That place is like, you know, I'm convincing a Nigerian that no, mom, I'm staying here because I'm going to make it. They're like, oh my goodness, well, I'm not sending you any more money. And that's a normal Western unit. You're now like, yeah, like this is this is life. And you're you're like 
I need to, and I have a responsibility to tell these young girls this because right now they're seeing me travel business class, they're seeing me with nice things, they're seeing me, but I've worked for these things. I've worked at MTV, I've worked hours, like on godly hours at 3 a.m. I'll be doing a red carpet somewhere, I'll be hosting a show somewhere just so that I can, you know, save money and move and do my own thing. But they don't see this. If there's a lot of instant gratification and as I've got a lot of girls that say to me that, oh, you know, like, I need to pay hospital bills. And I understand it, but I don't agree with it. I need to pay hospital bills, so I need to go to that guy that's been calling me, yeah, he's married. I'm like, no, you don't, because it's going to come back to bite you in the ass. So for me, I feel like I'm trying, especially this year, to project a more real version of my life. So as much as I might get paid to influence a watch or something, I want to balance it so that these young girls are not being led astray and just young people in general because it's easy to see something and sit on Instagram and be like, yeah, but she has this nice thing. Oh, this is not fair. I want to do what kind of have you? Does she have two heads? You know that kind of thing. But somebody needs to start telling them that, no, this is the way, this is life. That is not really life because that is long, it's short term. It's not long term. It's better to work hard. And I feel like that's one thing that, uh, we're, we're kind of still in the same generation, mm. but I still feel like, <laughs> <laughs> because and my brother is a bit more sport than me. So he'll feel like, oh no, I, I don't need to do, like, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do it. Oh, I don't need to, before, like when I see young people now, they don't feel like work experience. Oh, why, why am I working for free? Like, I can go and get a job. Like, no, you learn so much. I learned so much working for free. I'm not saying you should all go work for free, but there are certain skills that you will learn at places that are not paying you. And you have to take that knowledge and use it because it will benefit you later in life. But everybody just wants money. They just want luxury life. And they're not willing to sacrifice things. You are going to work hours that you don't want to be working. You're going to get, you're not going to get paid for these hours, especially in Nigeria where people don't really, you did the, the minimum wage is rubbish. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you have to really, just, I just feel like people need to just start speaking the truth more and having these conversations so that we don't have a generation that's been split by social media. Yeah. Always having conversations with young people, always taking on interns, and I feel like in that way I'm helping a pattern of how people are preparing for the industry because I find that the industry is very glamorized. People are on social media posting nice clothes, but they forget that there's a whole chain supply chain or a whole cycle of work that's going on behind the scenes and a lot of time people come to, I have interns come in almost every other two months and they come in and they, oh I wonder, and then when you're fitting this, this celebrity, oh when are you going for this event and they realize that, no, most of the time you are, you are in a factory with tailors sewing, you are not looking nice, you are not smelling nice, sometimes you are sleeping, I remember fashion week last year, I was literally working for three nights back to back because we had to prepare for the show. And the intern that we had, literally the day after the show, we just crashed, she was sick for like how many days after. And people don't see that, people don't understand that there's a lot that goes into creating clothes. It's not pretty and well packaged. It's not that industry, there's a lot more that goes into it. So sometimes we need to understand that. And also because the way the fashion industry is, the structure isn't set. So lots of people come into the fashion industry with the idea that they're supposed to be designers. Forgetting that there's, 100 other career points that are actually in fashion. You could be a producer, you could be a pattern maker, you could be a stylist, you could be a writer, you could be a fashion journalist. There's so many other sectors and people think that, oh, the only thing I can be is a fashion designer. So one of the things I do is I work with other people too, other people in the industry, like brand managers. We have an event coming up. Brand managers, social media managers, just to prepare people for the idea that maybe you're not supposed to be a fashion designer sometimes. You know, some people are fashion designers, some people are meant to do other things, you know. So we have to make people understand that the fashion industry, for it to function, function properly, people need to break into other sectors of the industry. And then with the brand as well, every collection is actually a social conversation. So we had a collection last year which was focused on boys who have been abused in schools. And we were talking to um, a lot of boys who you know, have been raped and who have been, um, it was a very emotional um, situation. We did a collection around the guys who, the fishermen who, um, we literally live in the shanties, we've done collections around so many different things and started this competition and not just started them but also worked on helping those people. So every collection is sort of devoted to helping someone. It's not just about creating clothes. Because I find that a lot of the time here people get so lost in I just want to make money, I just want to do this and do that and you know be the most important designer in the world. I'm not focused on being the 
best designer and focused on being an impactful designer. So doing more than just selling, but actually helping the industry move forward. And that's why being able to create global content is very important because I've had meetings with some of the biggest stores in the world. I don't know how many designers have had that interaction. And I've been at least, I remember I had a meeting with the guys from Kenzo, and they were like, oh, you know, this is amazing. But what if you move your stuff out of Nigeria, maybe not produce in Nigeria, you know? And that is literally what I've met growing up as a designer from Nigeria. So a lot of the time, there's so much negative, you guys don't know how much negative information there is about us out there. Not just about us as people, but about us in terms of our work ethics, in terms of what we have, our materials, our resources. So we go out to prepare for this conversation. We go out to change those conversations. When I go out, it's more about saying, you know, this is what you heard, but this is not what is true. This is what we can bring you, and this is quality. So it's about exporting quality content, about exporting quality clothing. It's about you that beyond what you've seen on CNN, you know, beyond the malaria and the mosquitoes and all of the things that you see online, there's actual talent. There's, and this is why all people are coming to Nigeria now. It's not because, oh, maybe, it's because there are people who are doing this work and who are exporting. There are people like Lisa, like Jenna Sego, there are artists like Chris Kim, like David, who are going out and teaching people that beyond what you've seen online, there's actual, I mean, look at, so people who are changing the face of media outside and so people are beginning to say okay why not come to Nigeria to find out what is actually here and let's come to Nigeria to see the real creative content that actually exists and that's what we're doing and that for me is really a huge social change and I think that that's what the creative industry has really done to change Nigeria. If you leave this to me he's just trying to tell you that we want to have like a sort of reset like a new world order for like majorly the youth because we are the ones leading the creative industry so this is a brunch bringing us all together talking sharing ideas socializing with each other making sure um, we are getting to know each other properly to hence uh, more peace more unity in the in the industry as um, in the creative industry so i'm really happy i got invited by Nyafe to this um, brunch because I feel like it's really a great one. And yes, I'm here today at this event and um, it's all about like a, it's a gathering of um, content creators, bloggers, photographers and the likes and um, yeah, it's fun. I love the atmosphere, I love the people I've met. It's actually a great um, place to actually network. Uh, I feel great being here today. I've spoken with my brother for a while about this actually. I think just over a year ago he had the idea for this brunch and it was only recently that he came to me and said that he was going through with it. So it's been great seeing him work very hard on this. It feels good being here in Nigeria, especially hanging out with like minds that take the health of the country seriously and what direction we're moving. Not to say that this is a political event, but um, you ask me what I feel about the new world order. I, in the context of the well-being of Nigeria, I would hope that it translates to literal meaning and the world moving in a, Nigeria moving in a positive direction. I'm here today at the New World Brunch with a whole load of young creatives in Nigeria that are doing amazing things. Um, I feel awesome today. It's good to get to network and to know the people that are here. Today we are here at the New World um, Order Brunch, you know, just trying to network with other like uh, people that do what we do, trying to like uh, make a difference in what's happening in like today's um, society. And everybody has, uh, there's more branches, there's Ovation, there's um, Heap TV presence. So, like, obviously, we're just trying to like network and like figure out how 2019 is going to be for everyone. So, yeah, I'm excited to be here. My question is what do you do when you feel like everything is blank, like the road is blank, you're not really getting clients in, you're not, you know, you're, you kind of feel like you're in this alone. And sometimes it can be a mental thing you're battling. How do you come? I don't come back, I like move forward. I feel like I'm going through that myself right now. Thank you. And you feel like, oh, I'm putting in all of this work and it's just not coming out the way I want it to come. Then sometimes it means you need to really change your strategy. So sometimes maybe your strategy is like, oh, I want to do these types of shirts, I want to do this my creative way, maybe if I want to be inspired, I travel. Sometimes it's time to just totally change what it is that you've known, to do something that you've not known before. 
And that sometimes is what inspires us to totally do something that will even take it to the next level. Because for me, I remember when I started, I was trying to do women's wear, women's wear, but I felt like, oh, I needed to do both. I was just like, I don't need to do women's wear now. I just threw it to the side. I was like, I'm not doing this. When I'm ready, I'll do it. But for now, it was like, oh, but women's sports. And I was like, no, I want to focus on this. I want to thrive in this. I want to figure out how I can push this as a business. And that was literally what changed my path for me. So sometimes it's about taking a step back, figuring out what isn't working, talking to the right people, and that just takes you to the next level. But don't sit in it. If you feel like you're sad or your leg or it's not working, don't be comfortable in that. I like the fact that you asked because it means that you want to solve it. So don't sit comfortably. Challenge yourself to talk to the right people. And I haven't had a discussion with a man about like somebody like a producer, um, that's, that's a man, about like, the way they pay women. However, I have spoken to women who are um, directors. So for example, Kimia Dinsba came to speak at one of the presenter workshops that I did and she was saying to me that, oh, she, and, and also Chiga, we were both saying that, oh, we really don't like the way extras are treated, for example, on set. So this isn't just women. But people like extras, and also women as well. Um, if you have people and there's a source that we can actually come to to verify these young people and say, okay, they're good and whatnot, we can now negotiate a better pay rate for them. But I feel like because of the lack of structure in Nigeria, it's not just women that are getting paid less. I know that if I co-host a show, most of the time men do get paid more than me, um, which is another conversation. But we yeah. even need, we, we even need to, everybody first needs to get paid well. It's not even a, a, a discussion about women. It's even just extras, just people in general. We don't get paid well enough for our time in the entertainment industry. It's something that if we stop, but we don't stick together as well. So if a brand calls me, for example, say, I don't know, if a drink brand calls me and says, oh, Stephanie, we're going to offer you one million naira to post three posts. And then I say, oh, it's too small. And then they ask somebody else in the entertainment industry, maybe they have the same traction as me. That person might say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do it. Instead of us to call each other and say, oh, that, how much are they? Everybody's busy competing with each other. That They don't even want to ask, no, why should I call her? Why what's my own with her? If she likes to take it, she likes to take it. If you stand as a unit, it's harder for them because if nobody will agree, if we all say, oh, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it, they won't have anybody to use, but somebody is always going back and saying, don't worry, I'll take it. And then you, then you didn't take it because you want to stand your ground. You don't get any money and then there's just no loyalty. So I think we have to build that relationship first and then we can all start fighting about women's pay and all these other things. But first, we need to start loving each other and not seeing each other as competition. So that's a discussion and that's why social media is there. Yeah. Well. So maybe this is a, a discussion that I can have with people on social media. On the one hand, because I want to go to TV and I think, like, I'm just intrigued if you think that, but also whether or not that's unfair that like an accent might have helped you get ahead, especially in Nigeria. So I'm just wondering a bit about accents and like the politics around okay. accents. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story. It's really short. When I moved to Nigeria, um, I moved because I got a job um, acting on a show. But yeah, you know how Nigeria goes. They say, oh, come and do this show. And then you shoot for one week and then you don't hear anything again. So it's, it's, it was between going back to London and, and staying. So I thought, oh, let me start job hunting. Why not? Okay. So I went to a radio station and I did an audition. Apparently, my audition ended up in the dustbin because I now had to find somebody else that worked at the station and I said, oh, I submitted like my CV and I did an audition and it, it didn't, I didn't hear anything. And he said, okay, let me do some legwork. Then he found out it had actually been trashed. So I met the person who trashed my audition and I, he said it to me, he said, oh, you know, because I, well, I'm sorry for doing that, but you guys just come and then you think you can take our jobs because you have more funny accents and this, 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 that, and the other. And I was like, whoa. First of all, I didn't even know that I had some type of white, like privilege. Because apparently that's like a privilege to have an accent. But where I'm coming from, I, 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 I didn't get it. It's if you're not good or you're not good, okay? It's one accent again. So, yeah, I, I, I was like, okay, this is very new. Um, and then again, yes, people would say, oh, I'm sure you get stuff because of your accent, like young people that are trying to get into media. And I say to them, well, I pray every time I go into an audition that God, if they're picking me for any reason other than my talent, I don't want this job. There are jobs that they'll call me for and I'm thinking, 
oh, I don't think I can do this well. But they're like, no, no, no. We like the way you did this, you did that. They don't tell me it's my accent. If you tell me it's my accent, I'm not supposed to be doing that job because you're not booking me for the right reason. And I never want to feel like, oh, I got this job because of my accent. Because guess what? That doesn't put me on an international... Um, I'm not playing with the big dogs. If I go back to the UK and you tell me, and, if I, and I say, oh, I got the job because of my accent. They're like, yeah, everybody has that accent. You're not special. What's special about you? Oh, I'm bubbly. I'm charismatic. I have, you know, so it's, it's tricky because I can't turn my accent off. And also my accent has it also stops me from getting jobs that I really want. Right now, I'm trying to learn Yoruba. Like, I speak Yoruba, but I don't speak it fluently. And I'm trying to learn Pidgin more. So, if I'm talking to a cab driver, for example, I can start saying, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, do you see me by whatever. I can try and do, but it's not fluent. And I want to be fluent because I, I want to be able to speak my mother tongue language, right? But I also want to book jobs here and now I'm having the issue that people here have because employers have been so they've been stressing people about oh you don't sound American enough how can they sound American when they're not American why would, why would, why would I be in a car listening to a radio station and listening to British people all over when they're not British like it doesn't make sense for me I didn't know that's what I was stepping into I didn't know that there's been this wave of like Brits and Americans are taking jobs just because of their accent I didn't know that. I was very young. I was like 22. So I was just, you know, oh, okay, Nigeria, I'm family, I my family, it's my country, everybody loves, you know, each other. No. It is not like you have white privilege. So you have to really show that you are talented and really just have dignity and don't. Uh, I, were you asking me like what you could do? Because I think we can. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get a sense of the act of the coach to get ahead. No, yeah, I, well, I hope not. I honest to God, I hope we did. But I know it would, it definitely did. I'm aware of it. And it definitely has probably helped me. Um, but I always tell people, if your addiction is good, you shouldn't really have a problem. There are quite a number of people who don't have accents. I, I want to believe that people like IK, IK doesn't, does IK have an accent? Okay, IK is like one of the biggest hosts. Does AUK have an accent? Okay, so when people tell me, oh, it's, back, it's not by accent, because that will only get you so far. After they see that you can't remember scripts, you can't read teleprompter, you're yeah, useless. So accent or no accent, you're just a talking head, you're yeah, dummy on the TV screen. So please, if you have, you have an accent, great, but I hope you are actually a good presenter. I hope you're working on your craft, on your skills, on techniques, you're learning, you're taking classes wherever you can. Don't, don't allow anybody in Nigeria tell you that, oh, you have a British accent now, oh, don't worry, we'll book you. If they're booking you because of that and you're not actually good, it will come back to bite you in the butt later. So, yeah, just focus on talent. Um, you actually listed guys, and I think with guys, they don't need an accent, but with the women, your accent is... If you, if you really look at it... Wait, let me see. No, no, no. I'm going to incriminate you. I don't want to argue about that, but it's just something that came to mind before you said. In the past years before where women were getting ahead whether because they were light skinned over a girl who was dark skinned or were getting ahead because they had accents. I mean there's an existence of that. Yeah. The women who got jobs because we knew that they had accents. Right? So it's definitely something that exists or has existed in the past but thankfully I think it's changing with time yes. because of I think people are becoming more aware, so it's a case where people are being confronted, the issues are being confronted now. So if, for example, that did exist, social was changing the way people think they need to have accents, it's just about bringing people who are quality, people who can have good diction, who can actually act and sing and do all the things that the job would have required originally. So it's definitely harder for women, let's not ignore that. So when a woman does succeed in an area that a man has succeeded in you know, for a long time, it's definitely something to you know, to applaud more, you know, especially in Nigeria, because I know, I, I believe me, I see women, I have sisters, and I know what my sisters have gone through in their own, my sister is a lawyer, and sometimes she'd go to, she'd go to, <laughs> she'd go to cases, and they would say they prefer to see a man, and she's somebody who's a leading lawyer, do you know what I mean, and they would, you know, confront her, and say, oh no, we have to see a man, I don't want to talk to a woman, it has to be a man, so let's not ignore that, it's something that we, not only women have to fix, but as men, we also have to address, and you know, it's just the fact, so let's not ignore it. Yeah. Then Yafet told me about this. I was really enthusiastic because, I mean, it's an ecosystem that we can breed together as creatives, young creatives in Nigeria doing 
big thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see this happen. And this is the first one, so it's definitely going to get bigger and better. Yeah. Um, this is a very wonderful idea, something very good. Um, it's a way of meeting other creatives around here. And I feel really happy. You know, I never expected it, but it's, you know, it's fantastic. So. I'm a DJ and the creative director of Backlight. Um, I'm here at the New World Order brunch and it's a really nice atmosphere. It's nice meeting people, interacting with people, um, and I'm having a good time. It's a Sunday afternoon and it's just very chilled and yeah, it's fun. Um, Adebayo, I wanted to talk about your style. Like, what is your retro, like, former year? Is it like the 90s, 80s? My personal style. Like, your, is it old school or new school or new? No, but I'm saying personal yes. or the brand style. Your style? personal style. It's a bit old school. Just old school. It's, it's like, <laughs> my, dad always, <laughs> my dad always says it's from him, so I'm assuming it's definitely old school. Oh, like, I was so like, no, it's, it's, it's me. I'm the one that makes you look this way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, I see that you have a lot of like you like a lot of brown, um, yeah. yellow watcher. I think I think to be honest, in terms of my personal just things that already existed in the seventies and the eighties and nineties, that people are just renewing and rejuvenating, yeah, and, you know, and regurgitating it. So I prefer to look back and sort of take from that. Even sometimes unconsciously, it just kind of happens. But the the brand is more. The brand is. The brand is also, it also takes from, I really like the 70s a lot, like a lot in terms I of see the brand. It, well, that's yeah, why I the brand. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. I really do. I think, I think it was such a beautiful time in terms of like fashion and mm -hmm. art and expression. So I do for Orange Culture a lot take from the 70s and throw it into the current and just modernize it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's like generally, also Mr. collections are like thicker fabrics and things like that, but then it's like as a Nigerian designer, also you, because you're trying to cater to the Nigerian market and the international market. So what's going to make your also Mr. collection different from your spring summer collection? And also, if you're like producing in Nigeria, as you do, it's like how do you keep up with deadlines? So you have so many designers struggling to keep up with international Western deadlines, um, and then you have Nigerian designers releasing their also Mr. 19 collection when other designers prior to releasing their autumn winter 20 collection and it's just like how what are you doing how are you trying to compete and like definitely there's deadlines to meet nigerian tailors it's not easy working with tailors and things like that but at the same time it's like should we be setting our own standards and then presenting it to them or trying to keep up with their standards because i feel like that's what we've been doing for a long time trying to keep up with their standards and it's not really working i mean some people are trying but it's what, what are your thoughts on that as like a designer who's obviously in my back? For me, personally, the reason why I work with standards in terms of seasons is because my focus isn't just to be local, it's to be international. So, for example, if you meet with a buyer, a buyer will always ask you for your autumn winter line sheet or your spring summer line sheet. And I remember the first time that changed for me was when I met Carl Lagerfeld and he told me a designer that misses the season is never taken seriously internationally. So if you're, if, you're, um, if you're a designer who doesn't show consistency, that's not enough, you understand? It's like you're out of the big games, you know? And he told me straight and he's like, oh, so if you don't have a next season, then we really don't care, you know? So at the end of the day, it's a choice for you. I feel like every designer's journey is very different, you know? There are designers abroad who also do one collection a year. There are designers who do two collections, there's others who do ten collections a year. At the end of the day, the journey is yours and it's you to decide what your customer base needs. I have customers who are quite demanding and who want to see new things every other season. If possible, they'll maybe do seven collections a year. But for us, it's about creating stuff that can meet not just our Nigerian clients, but stuff that can meet our clients in China, in, in New York, in London. And 
Unfortunately, they can't wear formal clothes throughout the whole year. Do you understand? They can't wear the shirts we are wearing here. But what I would advise is if you want to be an international designer but still sell here. So if you have an autumn winter collection, your autumn winter collection can have jackets and still have light shirts. So be able to segment it in a way that, okay, this whole collection, this can be sold to people here. This can be sold to people abroad. We have easy shirts. We have some trousers here that even if it's a seasonal change, people here can still wear without sweating buckets, you know. So it's about just being strategic about your decision and understanding that, okay, if I want to take this path, I have to work around the deadlines. I have to prepare myself to be able to sacrifice my time more, work around working on my quality. But if you don't want to do that, it's fine. Just understanding that it's about you. It's not about anybody else. It's your decision. It's your business. It's your investment. So don't try to chase somebody else's journey. Your own path is different. If you want to be a designer that only makes Agbada, you don't need two seasons. You really don't. You don't need to do fashion week. And that's what, I have an issue with every designer thing they need to show at fashion week. It's unnecessary. If you're a streetwear brand, do a pop-up shop. Do a presentation in your store and sell your t-shirts there. You don't need to do a fashion, you don't need to do anything over elaborate. So understand that every business should have their own setup and understand that this is what I do. Understand your customers, understand who you're selling to and what they need and then work towards that. Don't feel like, oh, you need to compete with everybody. Everybody's not your competition. Know who your competition is. Work alongside that and compete in that way. Don't feel the need to do what everybody is doing. I can give you examples of designers who are abroad that don't do seasonal collections and it's fine for them. So just understand what you want to do. Have your business plan or your business model and work based on that. And that's all that needs to happen. So that's a very, very difficult battle for literally every designer here. Um, but I think one of the most interesting things is that when you have a problem that is consistent, it forces you to have to think outside of the box. And one thing that that has done for a lot of Nigerian designers is it's forced us to start using local resources. For example, if I knew that it wasn't that hard for me to import, I wouldn't feel the need to create cotton here. Like now, we work with getting cotton in the north because they actually can create the cotton here. Or if we have to dye stuff, sometimes we do like dye sweaters or we use like Ajire and then we can force them to you know, create those sort of things here. And we started trying to get in our own printing machines and whatnot. But what that does for you is it forces you to feel the need to use your resources around here. In terms of imports, it's always going to... <laughs> I don't know if that problem is ever going to change, to be honest. I think one thing it has taught me is just to be a personable designer. In the sense that you have to find the need to interact with people. In Nigeria, one of the best things about being in Nigeria is there's always somebody you can call to help you. <laughs> if you are suffering and your fabric... I remember one time I had a show and my fabric was stuck with customs for like three weeks. And I had to create a collection that I should have used maybe a month and a half to create in two weeks. And literally, I had to start looking for who was going to help. Because I was like, I'm just going to leave this. I mean, I don't let, me be, let me just allow it to come out at its own time. But I had to find somebody who was able to just help me to talk to someone and just take it from there. But I would advise that, you know, anything you don't need to get outside of Nigeria, anything that you know you can't, that, you know, you can actually source here, just source it here. Just do the work. There's so many fabric places in Nigeria, so many fabrics that are local that we don't know. There's Akwete, there's Ajire, there's Ashoke, there's all these things that can be diversified, that can do so much, you know, that can, you can actually play with to create what you want. And then the things that you know you can't you know, get from here, that you now have to find a way. Like, thankfully, there's people like Jan Tsukidi. Jan Tsukidi has been super helpful with getting things. They literally, from any part of the world, you just get them. They'll sort out customs for you, sort out all of that, and they will bring your fabric to your house. So that has forced, yeah, that has forced people to create these companies. What? I'm not to them. I've saved me so many times. <laughs> No, I'm not related to them, but that's just proof that they've done work for me and they've saved me a lot of hassle. So I think one of the things I'll challenge you guys is once you see that that is a problem, then maybe that's something you need to look into. Maybe it's a, it's a solution that you need to find, you know, you need to be the one to, you know, fix. But I feel like every problem is, is impressed in your mind for you to do something about it. So if you're really passionate about it, then maybe you should start thinking of how you're going to help that process move forward. Um, you said you, that you at, at 20 decided that you were going to go into a design and blast out and stuff. Since then, have there been any points where you doubted your creativity and you were shaky about your career path? That's one. Follow up question is 
what advice would you give to other creatives like you, younger creatives or even older who are doubting their creativity at the state that they are in? The doubts probably existed for me until two years ago. And that's as honest as I'm going to get with you. Literally two years ago. And it changed when my dad came into my house and he was like, oh, um, I think you should work on changing this factory, maybe do this and do that. And my dad and I, you know, we never agreed on the career path I took for so many years. I mean, I'm one of those kids who knew what I wanted to do since I was like 10 years old. So I was fortunate enough to discover that as a child, I wanted to do exactly this, you know, and to have to convince <laughs> my father was like a whole battle and tell. He was like, okay, I'm just not going to collect any. I remember I was like 17 and I was like, I'm just not going to take any money from you at all until I figure out what I want to do. So that was basically my fight. It was like I wasn't taking any, so I basically didn't take any money from my parents and I was just figuring out my path on my own just to convince them that, oh, this could be profitable. It could be a career that could actually impact people's lives. It wasn't just about, and one thing I realized is that my parents really cared. It wasn't about, oh, they hated me doing this. It was just, is this a sustainable career path? Especially for a country where fashion wasn't thriving at the time. I mean, eight, 10 years ago, in fact, 17 hours, let me not say how old I am, but that's like <laughs> over 10 years now. <laughs> but um, I mean, that was, that was a time where fashion was at, literally at the seed points, literally there were like three famous designers who were actually doing something. There was Diola Seiko, there were like two other people who were really you know, pushing at that time. So there wasn't an industry. And to have to convince my family that this is what I wanted to do was a battle. So for me, there was always doubt. It was like, okay, am I doing the right thing? And, I, and the worst part is I was working at Shell at some point in my life. And to now stop working at Shell and to say, oh, I'm not going to do Shell. <laughs> That's like, you know, so I always question like, oh, is this the right decision? Am I not supposed to be working in an office? I'm smart. I have a master's degree. Why am I fighting with tailors? You know, there's just times where it's, but for me, every time I saw the progress and every time I felt like, oh, change had happened or I had impacted someone's life, it started erasing all of the doubts. And I feel like once you're so passionate about something, if you stop doing it, if you choose not to, it, you'll feel so terrible. I'm telling you this. I remember when I was in school and I had to take a break from doing fashion. The emptiness I felt, I can't explain it to anybody. So once you know that it's something that you can't do without, you have to do it. I'm sorry to say. I think one of the things that helps is, um, or helped me, let me use my own experience, is interacting with people who are doing what you're passionate about. So for example, if you know any designers, or in fact, you can talk about it later, but just having an interaction with someone about their journey, somebody who can be real with you, believe me, helps open up your, it opens your mind up, because what I found is that when I started working, I didn't have the opportunity to meet with a lot of mentors, I didn't really know a lot of older designers, I didn't really have a school to talk to, so the things I went through was just me going through, I couldn't really call anyone, and I remember like a few years ago, I met an LDA, so Auntie Larry, I don't know if you know Larry Da Silva, and um, my, who have been so amazing to me, even Lisa, Lisa as of recent, and I can just call them and say, okay, this is what I'm going through, what do you think, you know, sometimes all you need to do is converse with these people, have a conversation, and literally the problems just start coming apart, and also if you feel like you're at a place where your journey isn't working, or you feel like, oh, I'm putting in all of this work and it's just not coming out the way I want it to come, then sometimes it means you need to totally change your strategy. So sometimes maybe your strategy is like, oh, I want to do these types of shirts, I want to do this my creative way, maybe if I want to be inspired, I travel. Sometimes it's time to just totally change what it is that you've known to do something that you've not known before. And that sometimes is what inspires you to totally do something that will even take you to the next level. Because for me, I remember when I started, I was trying to do women's wear, women's wear, because I felt like, oh, I needed to do both. I was just like, I don't need to do women's wear. No, I just threw it to the side. I was like, I'm not doing this. When I'm ready, I'll do it. But for now, it was like, oh, but women's wear. And I was like, no, I want to focus on this. I want to thrive in this. I want to figure out how I can push this as a business. And that was literally what changed my path for me. So sometimes it's about taking a step back figuring out what isn't working, talking to the right people, and that just takes you to the next level. But don't sit in it. If you feel like you're sad or your neck or it's not working, don't be comfortable in that. I like the fact that you asked because it means that you want to solve it. So don't sit comfortably. Challenge yourself to talk to the right people and 
if you need to chase people and go to their office and say, I need to do this, I need to fix this problem, do it, but don't just wallow in, you know, in exhaustion or in the blank states. I, I didn't know, well, I, I knew this, but I didn't know the extent to which um, so celebrities and social media influencers really do help businesses. So I know that people send me clothes a lot, and but I, I just see it as, okay, I know I charge sometimes, I don't charge, okay, I've built a relationship with this designer, but I know that working with certain designers, I, I know that what I've done for their business. And um, just last week I was talking to a designer about doing something and she said to me that, oh, and then I asked if she still had a jacket that I wore two weeks prior. And she said to me, man, eh, that jacket is sold out, I've made 50. I've had to make, make 50 of that because of that time you wore it. Like, and I don't even have the manpower, I don't even know what I'm going to do. So when you say, when you talk about clients, there are people that you can also reach out to. Because I do, I do work with designers when they do message me, oh, hey, I like your stuff, blah, blah, blah. We have we have a platform, and I don't have a fashion business. And people might say, "Oh, you should start a fashion business just because I wear clothes." But I'm not a fashion designer. If I decide to start do a collaboration, fine. But that's not my calling. It's not something I'm passionate about right now. But you are, and if you have good clothes, why don't you reach out to people that can display these clothes on their platform as opposed to sitting in self pity? Because as a creative, we do that a lot. We sit and we're like. Oh my god, nobody likes me, nobody cares, nobody wants to hire me, nobody wants my clothes. Oh, because you are creative, you give so much love and passion to what you're creating that when people don't when people are not receptive, it's emotional and then we sit and we think maybe I should do something else. But really you know there's nothing else you can really do. So as Bio said about collaborating and strategy as well, maybe you need to utilize the tools that are available to you more. So if you're based if your clothes are in Nigeria, slide into some people slide into my DM. And I answer them sometimes. If the clothes are really like, oh, okay, they slide and I'm like, okay, send these, you know, because it, it, it's good if it is a good look for me and it's a good look for you. So yeah, you should definitely try that as well. See, bios are really strong. Yeah. I'm gonna mention something that people don't want to talk about in this country, depression. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. we you mentioned depression and everyone's just like, ah, let's not move it. But is the thing going? Don't be scared. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, anyone can answer it, and if you both want to answer it, that's fantastic. So it's a thing where I was based in the UK for five years. I've been doing photography for eight years. Um, two years for free, you know, and whatnot. Directing two years, 2017, 2016, 2017. And there's this work ethic you spoke about that like people have here where they feel like you know they're entitled. And then when you're away, it's kind of like you have to walk your ass off, especially when you're Nigerian and you're abroad, you're a minority. And I come here now and I want to create here. And there's this one thing that comes, there's rejection because of the aspect of you don't have connection. Yeah? And it leads to depression. I'm not trying to rhyme here and whatnot, but it's just, it goes like, it literally flows in that manner. I've had things where, okay, I want to create something talking about being an entrepreneur in a country that doesn't really back you. And people are like, okay, it's mad, I love that, I love that. Let's, let's do that. But like, what are your connections? Like, you know, who can we get on this? And you start thinking to yourself, okay, I don't have that much connection. Then you start feeling like upset, like, oh, I'm trying to sell this idea to somebody, but they're telling me, even though I have connections, it's not going to work. There's no point of wasting time creating that. And a lot of young people are going through that right now because they are young. I have um, what's called um, interns that they see where I am now with my work and they're like, am I ever going to get here? They think I have connections, and I tell them, I don't have connections. I do everything with the bare minimum. People that know my work see how I create, and when I tell them how I did it, they're like, it's so low budget, but the end result is like there. So I want to pick your brain on the, whole, um, the aspect of connection and depression. How do you advise young people that create and to kind of like work around that? Okay, the closest I think I I can say that I've been I don't think I've ever been depressed because I I've, I've seen people who are depressed and how they feel on a daily basis. So I would say that maybe I was just down and upset. So I don't really know what it feels like to be completely depressed. And I do feel like sometimes people use that term loosely that I am depressed. You're not depressed. You just don't have money today. You are not depressed. 
Like you are just wallowing in insufficient funds at the moment. You are not depressed. You are upset at your circumstances. But I do understand that okay, depression is real, and some people are actually depressed. Um, and I think we need to talk about it more. And obviously, we're in a culture and society where people don't really allow you to talk about it because they say, "Go and pray." God, too fast in your prayer. Oh, it's evil spirit. No, I'm not. I have. I feel like I need meant. I need to see a therapist. I've said that before. Oh, I would like to see a therapist. And people just look at you like, ah, oh, yeah, mad. I put it to Yahweh. I say you're evil. So I'm evil with it. You know, what? I just wanted to work on it. But it's a natural. It's a normal thing. So it's like going to see the doctor. If you you hurt yourself. Oh, mentally, I want to check in i want to check with someone and i've i've seen that there are a couple of clinics popping up around lagos so yeah so people are starting to talk about it more um but yes i do agree that there is depression and yeah come on it's, it, we're number one for uh, poverty in the world so there's bound to be depression um connections i understand that but you see from a woman's point uh view it's, it's harder for me to talk because I know that as a woman if you look cool or whatever people are going to be nicer to you so they'll want to engage more with you and sometimes I think oh I use that to my advantage so I know that okay you're going to talk to me 10 minutes longer than you'll talk to a guy so let me make an impact whereas men in Nigeria as much as they're more privileged people still don't want to talk to you if you don't have anything to offer them at that point in time Okay. Yeah. Like oh, you look clean. You look nice, babe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's perception. So the connection thing is, it's something. It, it's annoying because it should, things should just be done the right way. But people still connection. I'm good at this job. You're you're a good photographer, but people don't want to book you because we don't know you. Who are you? And how do you get known? Well. You, somebody needs to give me a shot, right? So it's really about continuing to build your portfolio and utilizing the tools that are available to you. I keep saying this because now you guys have Instagram. When I moved to Nigeria, there was no Instagram. So there's so many people that have come from Instagram and now they're, you know, doing really well. So I don't think we're using our tools enough. We're using them for the wrong things, like reading gossip, like 24-7. How many times have you sent a message to someone and say, oh, you're an amazing actress, I would love to take pictures of you, and then see where that goes. Yeah, I do not understand what I'm saying. It's about collaboration as well, connection. That's, you can build collect, um, connections through that and coming to things like this and networking with people. For what's important to me, I think, is that you work with the people who, so you network sideways, you work with people who are your age group, you know, who are doing all of it. And I can give you examples of people who are doing great things, who are young, and who maybe were shooting on their own, they weren't waiting for magazines to give them opportunities. There's Steven Tyre, there's even Whitney, you, you know, I know what you've done. Yeah, it's true, I know you guys, if I, if I is writing for Banana Nigeria, you know, people who just, who did things on their own, you know, they shot on their own, they put their work with their friends, and put it out there, and, it grew to become something bigger. So I feel like the need for connections is so unnecessary now. Mm -hmm. Just prove yeah. yourself. Do work with your friends, with your age mates. Put your work out there. I know how many young people I've worked with. I remember even years ago when I wanted to shoot with, with Steven, I remember, and the people who were working with me, they were like, oh, why would you shoot with Steven? He's so young, he's this, he's that. You can shoot with anybody. Why would you shoot Steven? That, I was like, but like his work is interesting. Like, Don't you want to see where he can go? And everybody's like, oh, it doesn't make sense. But look at Steven now. Steven's shooting for Vogue. He's shooting for us. And everybody's like, oh, Steven's doing this. <laughs> but you know, so I feel like don't, don't focus on the negative. I got rejected so many times. I remember when I started, even to do my first show, before I got my first show booking, Studio Fashion Week, I had gotten rejected by the most, I remember that there was a really famous fashion week then, and they rejected me every year. Before I finally got accepted by Lagos Fashion Week, who now gave me my first platform. You know, and now all fashion weeks are like begging, oh come on, Sean, I'm like, no, no, no. I still went to I still went to school in Nigeria, it hasn't changed. So at the end of the day, it's like just focus on networking yeah. around you and yeah. building your portfolio and put it out there and you know people will pick on this, people will see that your work is amazing and that's all that would matter. And in terms of depression, I feel like it's very important to address your emotions, whether they're positive or whether they're dark. Don't ever ignore them. If you feel like, oh, you're unhappy constantly, you're waking up every day, you're unfulfilled, you're sad, 
please do something about it. Talk to somebody. There's so many spaces where you can get counseling now. Don't feel ashamed to feel bad. Don't feel ashamed of being depressed. Like It's so important to address your emotions as they come. Because we don't want people to get to a point where, you know, it's so dark that they just want to end it, you know? You really don't want that. So people should be able to talk about this. And I remember people always ask me, oh, why is your brand talking about being vulnerable and being emotional? It's because of things like this, because people are constantly fighting these emotions and they don't understand it. And unfortunately, we grew up in a generation, in, in a country rather, where it's just okay to sweep things under like carpet. Okay, I'm sad, oh well, you're a man. It's really for a man, you're a man. Just, you know, be a man, don't cry, be a man, don't do everything for a man. But you're dying inside and you're suffering. So please don't be afraid to communicate. Talk to people, talk to people around. If you know there are counseling areas that you can go to, I can, I can put, I mean, I know counseling places that you guys can, if anybody needs to talk, that you can go to to find counseling, to talk about these things. But don't be ashamed to, you know, it's not your fault. At the end of the day, it's based on your experience. So don't be ashamed to talk about being depressed or being sad or anything that, you know, that's just putting you down. Just don't be afraid of it. So please address it. And depression isn't funny, it's really not. Uh, people are literally, their lives are lost for years because they're depressed. They can't do anything, they can't stand up from bed. They just want to be in bed every day for the rest of their lives. And that is not a state that anybody should be in. So please address it before it develops to something worse. Beyonce is my inspiration. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't lie. She, her work ethic, you know why? Because she obviously, she's a musician, but the way she keeps, she just, she knows what she wants and she just keeps going. She doesn't, she just thinks about her creativity in everything she's doing. And you can see that, that she minds her business, she does her work and she always kills it. So it's like, who is, who is going to compete with that? When you don't even, she doesn't look at anybody else. She's not interested. So, and that's, that, that's a trait that everybody should have, like minding your business and focusing on your craft. Um, and then also, of course, you get people like Oprah and Kat Dealey and Ryan Seacrest that have been able, I, I really admire and I'm inspired by people that can do things outside of the create, but outside of their, their profession. So Ryan Seacrest is a host, but he created, he's one of the executive producers of Keeping Up With The Kardashians, as much as they might get on your nerves. He's created that and he will forever make money from them. So people like that really inspire me. You have to look outside of the box as well and to see how you're going to leave a legacy. So he's not, I wouldn't say Ryan Seacrest is like, oh, my old, the ultimate host, but because of all the things that he's been able to do with that platform is amazing. So yeah, definitely Beyonce, Oprah, Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> For me, I'm inspired by different things from different people. Um, so I'm definitely inspired by, I like the Kenzo business model, so I like how they're able to like, you know, do the sort of mid-range luxury kind of idea with like t-shirts and then still go to like fashion. So basically that whole brand inspires me in terms of a business model. I'm also inspired by musicians. I really like music a lot, but I like music that is conversational. So like I like it, I, like, I think Solange is so amazing. Um, I love I love the way she <laughs> deals with like race and uses music to have to be honest, she's one of the most amazing artists. I like childish Gambino as well. People who literally yeah. use art to you know to, yeah. Yeah, to talk about stuff and like basket as well. Just people who just don't sit in like you know who just don't sit down and like, oh yeah, I have a talent and I'll just look pretty and you know, all that stuff. I like people who actually think beyond you know, yeah. the square that's around them. Um, so I think that's really, for me in Nigeria, I like designers who inspire me. I love Larry that's so I love Lisa and I love mine because they've been able to create sustainable brands over the years. Um, I like the fact that in a country such as ours where it's so difficult to run a fashion brand, before I came, when I came it was difficult and they were here before us and they were able to set the path for us. So these are people who, because of them, they have been doors that have been open to us. So I'm very inspired by how they've been able to sustain their brands, create actual businesses out of fashion, and not just create clothing, but things that actually contribute to the economy. Because these people are hiring, no jokes, they're hiring, they're paying salaries, they're creating factories, you know, they're doing stuff. Omer Merkelerida is one of the most inspiring people I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> I'll always say this, just what she has done with the fashion platform, it's crazy, like, to think that she has been able to, do you know the reason why Susie Menkes and lots of people are concerned? It's because of her and what she has done with Lina's fashion. It's like the people who are changing the narrative, the people who are going out and putting out, you know, because it's easy to just put out content, but putting out positive content and drawing people to us 
for good reasons, you know, those are people who I respect and who I love to talk about, people who are talking about issues, who are combating social, you know, who are combating political conversations, the kind of people I like, not just people who are creating music that you just jump on the stage and, ah, no, I want people who are deep thinkers, so those are people that inspire me. Ladies and gentlemen, please around the world. Thank you so much for joining us on this panel. Thank you. Round of applause. Round of applause.